You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. So we work with foreign investors that are coming into the East African market. I noticed that you had a lot of brokers, a lot of middlemen, these more professional services, which I believe is a big reason why sometimes deals go wrong. Coming back to Africa and being here, you will torture yourself if you're not willing to adapt with how things are on the ground. For me, it's been an amazing ride. I have to say difficult as well and challenging to. There's so many exciting things happening definitely in the startup space, especially in Africa. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find inspirational people who are doing inspirational things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have a special guest, Amne Suwedi, who is director of Shikana Group, which is a legal and investment firm that specializes in foreign investments in East Africa. Welcome to the podcast, Amne. Thank you so much, Tessa. I really appreciate being here today with you. It's great to have you on the podcast today. I'm not sure if you've listened to the podcast before, but I like to start from the beginning. So I was hoping you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Amne Swedi. Okay, sounds good. And yes, I have listened to your podcast, which I love, by the way. Thank you. Um, Yeah, what can I say? I'm just an African girl, who, um, a bit of a third world child, like having grown up in Switzerland, born in New York, uh, spent time in the UK, in London as well. And uh, by training, I'm an international lawyer that focuses on investment, business and finance. I'm also an investment advisor, and I basically work with foreign investors who are coming into the African markets, the markets that I really focus on, the East African markets and the EAC. Yeah, so that's me, um, and that's what I do. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So you've given us insight into who you are, what you do. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, you are the director of Shikana Group. So I was hoping you can tell us a bit more about Shikana Group in terms of what you do and how you started the company. Okay, yeah, sure. So Shikana Group is an investment and advisory firm. Prior to Shikana Group being Shikana Group, it started off as being a law firm. So we were just giving legal services, especially to foreign investors. But then we basically evolved into more of an advisory firm uh, and also an investment firm. So we work with foreign investors that are coming into the East African market. And uh, we basically, in a nutshell, hold their hand and make sure that they don't lose too much money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's always important. So, <laughs> that helps. It does. <laughs> Indeed. It does. <laughs> so um, we have a team of lawyers, but also analysts and economists, and we have a very holistic approach in terms of investments in the region, where we not only ensure that the legal and regulatory aspects are covered, but also just ensuring that the investors really understand the market that they are doing business with the right people. And this really came about because I thought that there was a gap in the market when it comes to investments in Africa in terms of professional services that are rendered to foreign investors. I noticed that you had a lot of brokers, a lot of middlemen, none of these, you know, more professional services, which I believe is a big reason why sometimes deals go wrong or they become very difficult. So I saw a need for professional services in that space. And that's why I started the firm and basically combining the legal and also the investment knowledge 
I mean, that's a powerful combination anywhere in the world, but I feel that it's more so when it comes to African markets because of just how regulated and somehow complex the markets are. Thank you for that. During your introduction, you mentioned that you were born in New York, grew up and worked in Switzerland, studied in London, and then moved back to Tanzania. What was the reason for moving back? Um, So, of course, Tanzania is my country. At the time, actually, my father was in Tanzania. He was the only person in my nucleus family, that's to say my parents and, and my siblings, that was in Tanzania. And he was basically settled. And so I started toying around with the idea of going back to Africa. And so Tanzania was the easiest, given that, you know, my father was already there. Um, But that idea kind of came up because there was a lot of discussions going on on the global platforms around Africa and how the future is in Africa, the growth rates also at the time. So this is 10 years ago um, within Uh, various African markets was just really promising. And so I just figured that I should maybe go down there and check it out. So I spent the last 10 years really understanding the markets in East Africa, building the networks, but also being just on the ground for the last 10 years and dealing also like working a lot with foreign investors. I actually made the decision that I needed to have also a platform where it all started, that's to stay in Switzerland. So we recently opened an office in Switzerland so as to better serve the foreign investors that we work with and really give them a better service in terms of the local knowledge on the ground, but also just being in the same environment as the leadership when it comes to international companies that are making the decisions with regards to operations and business in Africa. Thank you for that. So you detailed why you moved back. So how did you find the transition moving back? <laughs> so I'm going, I'm going to answer this question and hopefully not get too much in trouble. Um, <laughs> To be honest, I grew up in Switzerland most of my life and I lived in Europe most of my life and I was educated there and I started my career there. So there are a lot of things that I've, you know, come to acquire and that have shaped my way of, you know, thinking and my way of approaching things. And and I don't really think that those things have gone away or are going to go away. But I would say that um, coming back to Africa and being here, you kind of will torture yourself if you're not willing to adapt with how things are on the ground, right? So I think it's more about finding that balance. There are some things that I will not let go of when it comes to maybe more the the way of working, you know, the the way of approaching certain things, etc. I think what I got from Switzerland, for example, is something that can serve me anywhere. Uh, but at the same time, there are certain things that over here on the ground that I've learned to adapt to and embrace as well. After 10 years, I've definitely found found my balance. I wouldn't say that I have transitioned completely because I don't think that is really possible. But I think I'm enjoying the best of both worlds in terms of, you know, ways of things, seeing things and approaching things. And yeah, and I think it works best for me that way. Thank you for that. You explained obviously your transition process and also embedding yourself into African culture and way of life and how that complements the work that you do. As we mentioned, your work focuses on investment advice in Africa and your specialism is on the legal side, which is extremely important. You've been doing this work in Africa for 10 years now, and I was wondering how have things evolved over the last 10 years that you've been doing this work in Africa? Uh, That's a good question. So now I've been a lawyer, let's say for 16 years, but in terms of like really being in Africa, yes, it has been uh, for 10 years where I've been really involved in in a lot of cross-border transactions, mainly in East Africa 
and really have been on all sorts of transactions and sectors, especially sectors. So from mining, fisheries, agriculture, fintech, you know, because the markets in East Africa are not as, let's say, mature and developed as markets, let's say, in the UK or in Switzerland, where so a lot of my colleagues over there, they're like specialized in, let's say, one sector or one area, and that's all they do. But in East Africa, it's very different. You can't specialize in just one sector. So you end up coming really multidisciplinary and just learning a lot of things in the business and investment environment, which has been really great. So for me, it's been an amazing ride, although I have to say difficult as well and challenging too, because of just how complicated it is to close deals on the continent at times. Um, And I don't want to say that in the last 10 years, it's gotten easier, meaning that Uh, It's gotten easier on the one hand because I've gained more experience, I guess, in that sense. But in terms of how long it takes to actually get projects off the ground, that has still remained to be as it is. What I would say is that once you do understand how things are done, what the dynamics are, it, it does become easier. So in terms of how things have evolved, I think for me, definitely becoming more and more comfortable with the environment and the fact that I really take now Africa for what it is and I'm not comparing it to Switzerland or the US or or the UK, I think it also means that things flow a lot easier. And then I'm also just able to effectively communicate the expectations better to clients because a lot of foreign investors from overseas, and especially from more mature and developed markets, they can't help but to have those same expectations, which can lead to a lot of frustration. So I think learning how to manage the expectations and also clearly communicating how things are, because I just take things for really what they are and I don't compare. Yeah, I think that's a very important point that you've raised. So you mentioned that you've worked in a range of sectors such as mining, fisheries, agriculture, fintech, and also the complications of working on the continents in those sectors. Do you believe Africa is as risky as it is sometimes perceived? That's a good question. I think risk is everywhere. Yes. Um First of all, if you're able to identify those risks and then if you're able to manage those risks and control those risks. So I think that the problem when it comes to Africa is that people really perceive Africa to be a lot riskier. Like it's just it's just in the minds of a lot a lot of people. When you say Africa, they're like, oh, my gosh. The only thing they think about is like risk and difficulty. And also, I think it's down to the continent not really doing enough in terms of PR and branding and, you know, communicating to the world the success stories. Unfortunately, mainstream media, I think, tend to report African matters to be in a very pessimistic way, like corruption, war, famine, and whilst all those things are there, but we still have to say that there have been massive improvements if you're comparing from the 1980s to date. Yes. Yeah, I would say that, of course, when you're looking at the question of how risky is it has to be broken down in which risk are we talking about. So if you're looking at, let's say, legal risk, I would say that, yes, legal risk is maybe much higher in a country like Tanzania compared to Switzerland. But then if you're comparing Tanzania and Kenya, the legal risk is a lot lower. The problem is that we tend to just say Africa is risky, but it's not really accurate either because there are markets where we're talking about different risk and also the risks are much lower, even if you're still in the same region, but the risks are much lower. Like I think there's a better application, understanding, embrace of the rule of law, for example. The judiciaries are a lot stronger, for example, in a country like Kenya versus in Tanzania. So that means that the legal risk when it comes to investments is lower there. Yeah, that's kind of how I view things when it comes to risk. 
Thank you for that, Amine. As you noted, risk is global, but it is about understanding and obviously quantifying the risk. So from a legal perspective, what tips would you give to people who are looking to invest in Africa? What tips would you give them in terms of how to navigate or mitigate some of those perceived risks? Okay, so first thing I would say is to get an advisor that understands Africa. What I've been seeing is a lot of international companies, they get their head of legal that has no real experience in Africa to lead investment projects in Africa, and they don't give enough credit or rather they don't lean enough on the advisor that really does understand Africa and how to do business. So it kind of poses challenges. So I would say getting somebody who understands Africa is absolutely key. Then I think another tip would be to definitely do due diligence before anything else. And I really mean thorough due diligence, you know, like just checking on the re- in the registry company and waiting for the official report from the registry of company is not necessarily enough you really need to go on the ground you need to try and talk to different people you need to use certain avenues so as to really get the information of who you're doing business with. I think that's absolutely key because there is a lot of perceptions of people and then it's very different when you're about to do the deal with them. And then, yeah, get a great lawyer as well who can understand your plans and really structure your investment from the beginning to really accommodate your five-year plan because it's expensive doing business in Africa. So it will definitely save you a lot of money And get a really good local partner, I would say, is also another really good tip I would give. Brilliant. So you touched on some key points, such as the importance of working with people who understand Africa, carrying out due diligence and getting a great lawyer such as yourself to put together a long term (laughs) plan. (laughs) So from the other side, what tips would you give to Africans who are looking to work with international investors? Because... From my point of view, the risk is both ways. So what tips would you give to Africans who are looking to work with international investors for them to protect their interests as well? What I would give as advice to Africans who want to work with foreign investors is the need to really understand the value that they're bringing to the table. Because what I have seen is that in a lot of partnerships or joint ventures between foreign investors and local African counterparts, because the major challenge on the continent for most countries in Africa is the access to capital for entrepreneurs and for business people, and more importantly, access to affordable capital, uh, we see that international investors are maybe coming from overseas and they have access to more mature capital markets or cheaper capital and they have the ability to fund projects that perhaps Africans can't because of the issue of capital. But I still think that I've seen because somebody is bringing capital, Africans tend to sell themselves short Yes, because of this lack of capital. But you can have all the capital you want, but if you have no understanding of the environment, you can lose that capital really fast. So it's not only about private capital and having it, it's it's also about who you're partnering with and what that local partner really brings to the table. So what I would say to African investors who are partnering with international investors is to really define the value proposition clearly and they should not give up too much on the terms and equity because I've seen that as well just because someone is bringing in all the money so to speak. Yes I agree 100% so I guess leading on from what you've just said one thing I've noticed is that In many African countries or cultures, we sometimes see the legal side as something we do after we have a problem rather than something we should do before the problem arises. So how can we go about educating businesses on the importance of establishing the proper legal structures from the start? 
Yeah, definitely agree with you. That is a challenge. And to be honest, I'm not really sure how to answer that question because educating businesses in Africa is a challenge in itself. I'll give you an example. When I was a lot more eager and, you know, wanting to help my brothers and sisters. So I tried um, a few years ago um, because I really saw the potential in the mining sector. Yes. Um, and, you know, there are millionaires in Tanzania who are in the mining sector, right? And they're small scale miners and they're making a lot of money, but most of their stories end up being like, and one day he had no more money or he died and the children are struggling, you know? Yes. So I basically did a workshop that was for free and it was with the Small Miners Association. I invited like all these small miners, you know, to come and to really try and educate them. And to be honest, even if they are sold on the need for legal services, but then when you tell them, okay, you can retain me or you can retain my firm for a fee and I can look out for all your interests and make sure that the money really works for you, et cetera. I mean, 95% of them will still reflect and say, yeah, but I have my cousin who just finished law school and he can do that for me for free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's really, really challenging. And that's why I was saying, like, I'm not really sure how to answer that. Of course, when you when you go to Kenya, of course, it's not all completely uniform. You know, in Kenya it's a lot better just because, you know, there's a much bigger middle class. They're aware of the need for legal services and they have the right mindset for it, you know. Uh, so it's not all uniform. It's not to say that it's all the same, but still, I mean, it's not the same as when you're talking about in Europe or in US or anywhere where the first reflex of anybody who wants to do anything before doing anything, they're like, let's find a lawyer, you know? So yes. here it's not quite the, yeah, it's not quite the same over here. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that information. So you've detailed the challenges of educating businesses on the continent with regards to the importance of establishing a proper legal structure. So if we approach it from a different direction, what are some of the challenges in the legal system in, say, East Africa that you won't encounter elsewhere? Hmm. Um. I think one of the major challenges that I've been seeing is that in the legislative process or making the laws and making the regulations, I think there's a lack of harmonization, I would okay. say, or effective communication between, let's say, ministries or even departments. So what you can find, and this happens a lot, is that there is a conflict in rules or legislations that are just conflicting because the Ministry of Investment has issued one regulation. Yes. And then the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, these are all examples, has issued another regulation that okay. touches on aspects to do with the Ministry of Investment's regulation, but is just totally contradictory. So... There is an issue there. There is a challenge in terms of the processes. So you can really find that sometimes that lack of harmonization or uniformity in terms of laws and regulations can really be difficult. You can meet stumbling blocks because you might need a permit or a license, but you're not going to be able to necessarily get it because there are two conflicting regulations. And then because there are two conflicting regulations, people are not going to be able to make a decision because they're scared of the conflict, you know? So, yes. so I think that's something that I've seen that is quite unique that I haven't seen elsewhere. So you've detailed the challenges or I guess the lack of harmonization in the legal system in East Africa. With those challenges also comes, I guess, a lot of learning. So what are some of the most important things that you've learned during the 10 years doing business or working in the legal system in East Africa? 
Well, I've definitely learned a lot in the last 10 years, for sure. And I think I've learned a lot about resilience. I've learned a lot about humility. I mean, when you're on an energy project in Africa, that definitely teaches you to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you kind of like start off thinking that, okay, this thing will just be done in one year's time. You have like, you know, <laughs> high level meetings. Things, you know, signing of like MOUs by the way they're unbinding. And then you're like 10 years later, you're still negotiating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> so I think, yeah, definitely humility has been a big lesson, but also just stop analyzing opportunities in the same way that you would analyze opportunities in more developed markets. So I think sometimes there are real opportunities, but maybe, um, you know, when I first arrived here, I was looking at things from what I had learned in terms of what qualifies an investment project to be viable. So I'll give you an example of like, you know, the, that requirement of like, you need to have financial statements for the last five years and, yes. you know, but then coming to realize that, a lot of businesses are cash based and also quite disorganized, but that yes. does not mean that, you know, they don't qualify as opportunities, you know, so really just kind of shifting the way you look at things in terms of the real environment that you're in, the environment that you're in here and not really letting go of maybe what you've learned elsewhere. And I think the final thing is that it is possible to do business with integrity in Africa. Yes, 100%. <laughs> and I say this because, you know, so many people, and this is like, you know, whether it's Africans, whether it's foreigners as well, who are not from the continent, so many people just tell you like, oh my gosh, it's not possible, you know, to do business with integrity. And no, I have to say that in all the years that I've been here, integrity is something that I'm not really willing at all to compromise on. And maybe things are, you know, slower and, you know, you have to be a lot more patient, et cetera, but it's absolutely possible. So yeah, those I think are the lessons. You touched on a key point there, which is to stop analyzing opportunities like you would from, I guess, a Western perspective or a Western lens. So if we look at the legal structure for a company looking to invest in Africa, what legal structure would you recommend that would give a client optimal cover in an East African market? Yeah, so it really depends on a lot of things. So there's not one answer, like, you know, you should have this structure. It really, really does depend. And I think the first thing that an investor should look at, a foreign investor should look at, is if there is any double taxation agreements or bilateral investment treaties between their respective countries, the country that they want to invest in and the country that they're coming from, because that will definitely help to make the right decision in terms of the structure. So if there is a bilateral investment treaty in place, then I would say the whole thing in a subsidiary is a good structure. But then again, that is not to say that it can necessarily work because you have to also look at what sector are we talking about? And you have to also be aware that a lot more and more countries in Africa, especially in East Africa now, have local content regulations and requirements. So your structure as a holding company that is, you know, uh, 100% foreign owned with a subsidiary in a market, in a, let's say, Kenyan market, is not necessarily going to be the best one in order for you to pursue opportunities or qualify for opportunities, let's say, in the mining or the oil and gas sector because of, you know, local content requirements that can vary in terms of the need for local shareholding, etc. So there's no one answer. It really depends. I think you have to kind of look at you know, are there any bilateral investment treaties that you can make the most of in terms of protecting your investment, but also reducing the costs and saving money? Yes. yes or no. Look at the sector that you're going into and the rules and regulations around that. And then you would be able to come up with a structure that would be the right structure for, for the investment in question. 
Thank you for that, Amne. You've given some fantastic advice. So your work focuses both on the legal and investment side. I guess there's a bit of crossover, but you know, you do specialize in legal and investment. So stepping outside of the legal space and focusing on investment, what are some useful hacks that you've kind of discovered to successfully investing in Africa? Yeah, so you're right. There's a lot of crossovers and that's why for us it made sense to have that offering uh, because we we feel that it kind of goes hand in hand. But I think the first thing I would say is get a really good local partner. I mean, many people think that they can kind of like do without one and, and you can do without a local partner, but it's just so much harder. Yes. So if you find like a good local partner, that's not just ticking your box of like Tanzanian, you know, the end, (laughs) (laughs) but if the local partner actually has skills and, you know, this knowledge and, you know, maybe access, et cetera, then it can really be such a reliable resource to to your investment on just so many levels. So getting a good local partner is key. Second of all, I think that it's really important to understand the market really well and adapt. For example, if it's a company that already exists elsewhere, let's say in the UK, it's very important to kind of adapt your products or services to the market in question. There's so many examples where, you know, your copy paste way, like just copy pasting is just not really going to work. You really understand Understand, need to understand your market. You really need to understand the consumers really well. So when you are launching, you have a very good chance of, uh, of succeeding. Another thing that I think is key, and unfortunately, still there's so many investors that just don't do it and they don't feel the need to do it. But I think it's so important to engage with stakeholders, relevant stakeholders. And, and you know what? Like so many people think that, You know, they're like, oh, I came and I met the president and, you know, we did a selfie, but I just don't understand why my investment is not going (laughs) anywhere. (laughs) So I think like, you know, of course, it's always good to have like that high level kind of endorsement, et cetera. But when you're in Africa, you understand that those are really not the people who are doing the doers in terms of like the people who are actually going to carry your investment forward and be of help and influence, et cetera. So you need to engage with local governments, for example, you need to engage with the grassroots community, you know, so you just need to kind of figure out who your stakeholders are, and you need to start engaging, communicating about your project, communicating about your plans, and making people really feel like they're a part of it. Like, trust me, you'll have less problems down the line than if you just parachute in, see the president or the vice president president, you know, shake hands and start doing your project. And no one knows who you are. No one understands who you are. And they just see like these foreigner doing stuff on their land. It's not going to go down very well. So stakeholder engagement is key. It sounds like we've had similar experiences. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure. (laughs) You've given some useful investment hacks, such as local partners, understanding the market, engaging with the right stakeholders, which is key. Continuing with the investment theme, we've had conversations in the past where we've discussed Africa's growing tech and startup space, as well as the amount of money that is being invested in that space. So I was wondering if we could discuss that area in terms of startups when accepting this investment. Are these startups founders adequately protecting themselves legally? I mean, have you had any experience in that space? Yes, definitely. That's such a good question. And, you know, yes and no. So the dynamics of, let's say, the startup ecosystem in East Africa is you have a lot more of these, you know, incubators and accelerators, uh, you know, that are maybe U.S. based or or UK based or wherever, but outside the continent that see an opportunity in the region 
and they come in and, you know, the idea is to, you know, get these startups on board and then eventually give them funding, right? So what I have seen is that you've got some really legitimate organizations that are going to try and do the right thing. So those startups that go through those systems, like the like of Y Combinator or, you know, other such like founder space, et cetera, they might come out with a fair deal. But that being said, it's always good practice to kind of always have your own lawyer and your own representation, no matter how fair or nice or kind you think somebody or an organization is. On the other hand, though, is that we've also seen very aggressive and Almost uh, predatory. Yeah, predatory, like really people who dub themselves angel investors. Yes, they're bringing in capital, which kind of circles back to to what we discussed before. Again, I'm bringing you capital, so, you know, I'm going to take everything from you, you know. And then founders in Africa not defining the value properly of what they have, what they're trying to build or what they have built, and really giving their company away for nothing almost, you know, just just because someone is bringing you $100,000, that over here can seem to be a lot of money, right? Yes. So people being like, oh my gosh, you know, at the moment, maybe you're struggling, you don't have that kind of money. So you feeling like, yeah, it's okay. You know, I've seen certain contracts where somebody has wanted to take like 90% of the company oh, wow. and the founders are left with 10%. Just <laughs> no, I'm serious. And and you know what's really unfortunate is that there are so many deals like that where where founders end up giving their company away or not protecting themselves adequately. So let's say even if they don't give all the equity away, but then they don't necessarily think about things like intellectual property rights. And so they end up signing these agreements that essentially transfer the ownership of the propriety right that makes the business to this angel investor or the company in question. You know, so so there's so many exciting things happening definitely in the startup space, especially in Africa. But I've seen also a lot of founders being taken advantage of, like even in terms of these accelerators and these incubators where they kind of go in. And the aim here is is essentially that organization is just essentially taking the, the information and the ideas and the development that they have and then they go off and kind of replicate it themselves or and things like this. So I think it's very important to kind of be very careful, again, get the right representation. You know, and I think I can understand the startups and the founders because maybe legal fees might be intimidating, but there's so many entrepreneurs, more and more, I would say, now maybe not so many, but more and more lawyers that are also very entrepreneurial. So maybe they can take a stake in your business, you know, a, a modest yes. state, a stake of like less than 10%, less even than 5% and kind of ensure that you're getting the right protections in place, et cetera. So, yeah. I think with conversations I've had with some founders and startups, I always advise if you are going to take on a co-founder, it's usually advisable to take someone who has legal expertise or yeah. I guess finance expertise as well. There are two areas where I think you can add value when looking for a founding partner. Yeah, definitely. Carrying on from that conversation, what are some of the dangers for founders if they don't protect themselves adequately when taking on investment? Oh my gosh, so many. I think, well, you know, you can literally just lose everything and without name dropping or anything. But there was a very sad case. There was a leading communication service provider, UK based with activities in Africa. And they did a very vulture acquisition, hostile acquisition, I would say, even to an existing company that was in Tanzania that was also, you know, a communication service provider, internet service provider, existed for a very long time. And the founders just lost everything for a really small payout because they didn't get the right legal advice or rather they felt that the fees were too high and that they can, you know, save money or something. 
So they didn't bother getting the adequate advice. And I guess they didn't understand the difference between diluted and non-diluted shares, you know, and (laughs) they find themselves like with absolutely nothing, you know. So it can really be dramatic, you know, but the unfortunate thing is that because us lawyers are trained to kind of always look for things going wrong, right? Yes. I mean, I have a lot of people who are like, oh my God, I'm nay, but you know, why are you so pessimistic and everything? I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> and you're like, well, you know, I'm not being pessimistic, but it's just that things can go wrong, you know, and it's important to kind of plan for those things. And, you know, a lot of business people that I've met don't have that perspective, obviously, right? I mean, that's why they're great business people and they're doing some fantastic things, right? Because maybe they're not thinking of like all the things that can go wrong. But it's important that if you're not that person who thinks of all those things that go wrong, just get someone, get someone who's pessimistic, so (laughs) so to speak, (laughs) you know, so that at least you can be like adequately protected because, you know, you, you never know, you never know with people, you never know with intentions, you never know with, with circumstances, things change, you know, things change and, and you just really need to be able to protect your yourself. Yeah. So it's very sad. Uh, There's a lot of people who lose a lot or, okay, apart from losing a lot, even their circumstances where the businesses are having to stop because they're in court on a dispute, which is a waste of time. You're not doing anything. The business is at a stall and you're you're busy disputing uh, contractual clauses that frankly, if they were structured in a better way, you, you wouldn't be in that position. Yes. It's definitely something to be aware of. And as we said, at the beginning of the conversation it's best to have the legal structure in place from the start than having to have discussions negotiations court battles at the end so let's take it on a positive direction and not be pessimistic so (laughs) stepping outside of tech founders and things going wrong if we look at i guess different sectors within africa what sectors do you anticipate that we will see significant growth in what sectors are you seeing a lot more kind of activity with regards to the work that you're doing Mm -hmm. Uh, So definitely infrastructure. Brilliant. That I think is an area that's just booming across the continent. I think um, energy, even though it is just so challenging to do those projects here in most African countries, to be honest, it's just so challenging to do these energy projects. But the way I look at things is that most countries are not producing enough energy, like enough megawatts of energy that that is needed for their societies and, you know, to really support that booming growth and industrial yes. drive. So it's not rocket science. They will just have to make things easier because they will just need energy. Yes, 100%. And I've been seeing a lot of interest, by the way, especially renewable energy. Yes. Um, because green projects are very much uh, being discussed, ESG, et cetera, on, on a global front. And, you know, because of just how the, the climate is in Africa, et cetera, I've been seeing a lot more investors really interested in renewable energy projects like, you know, wind, like solar. But then again, the difficulty of just how to close those deals are, yeah, it's a bit challenging. Another the sector is agriculture because of the global food security issue. It's a major issue at the moment. And so what we've been seeing, particularly from the US, from Australia and from other markets is more and more investors coming in and really wanting to invest in in agriculture. And then, of course, technology and fintech, I think, is going to be really big. Fantastic. So I guess going hand in hand with the sectors that you see significant growth, such as infrastructure, energy and agriculture. Are there any recent trends in African or East African laws and legislation that you're excited about that are enabling the growth in these sectors? Yeah, I think that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is very exciting for so many of us. Uh, And the fact that we're seeing its implementation, we're seeing really more and more countries in Africa really wanting this to work, which is maybe so different because, you know, 
in Africa, the concept of regional integration is nothing new. Most African countries, they have economic blocks and regional blocks, but they've been very challenged to kind of really make them work for the benefit of all. But we're really seeing that the Africa Continental and Free Trade Agreement is really starting to take shape and more and more governments are behind this. They really want to make this work. And I think this promises to make doing business in Africa just so much easier, which is what everybody wants. Um, But another thing that I'm seeing that I'm really excited about, actually, is the local content regulations, um, especially in the mining sectors and in oil and gas sectors, even in the energy sectors. And I think this is so important. And I'm so happy that a lot more governments are understanding that there is a need to change the face of FDI and to get more local people to be involved and so that the countries can benefit. And so I think these regulations that I've been seeing have the potential of changing Africa's trajectory from, you know, the resource rich, cursed countries to economies that can positively benefit from the natural resources that they have. Thank you for that. So you touched on the African continental free trade area, which is is a topic of discussion many times on this podcast. It's definitely a policy for the future, the future of Africa. So where do you see Africa in five years time from a, I guess, an investment and legal perspective? Well, given the fact that I'm seeing the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement really taking shape and there is a lot of work being done in terms of how to make this continental area really operational and how to make it work. So I would say that I'm really optimistic that a lot of non-tariff barriers and also tariff barriers for trading amongst ourselves in Africa would just be removed. I think there's a lot of work being done towards that. And from an optimistic point of view, I would say that in five years time, it would be great if all of these were being removed, because as much as we talk about, you know, foreign direct investment, which is great, but I think that we as Africans need to do a lot more business amongst ourselves given just the the sheer size of the markets that we're talking about. Um, But then again, I think through this uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement will bring the the harmonization of laws and procedures across the country. And of course, then this is going to be, you know, even more attractive, I think, for FDI, because they'll just be seeing this as a as a more attractive investment block. So that's kind of how I see it. Fantastic. And that's a very realistic and achievable vision. Where do you see yourself in Shikana in five years time? Um, I definitely see that we're going to be having a fund that's going to be investing in enterprises in the region. Brilliant. That's definitely where I see this going, yeah. So what kind of fund size would you be aiming for? What sectors would you be focusing on? Um, I think what I would really like to focus on is women entrepreneurs. Brilliant. Uh, just because I am one myself. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I have seen uh, and lived through the challenges of doing business. And there really are challenges and differences between male entrepreneur on the continent versus a female entrepreneur on the continent. So if I'm able to play my part in helping women entrepreneurs to be able to do business, to grow their businesses, uh, I think that would really be something that I'd feel extremely satisfied with. Fantastic. And I look forward to seeing that fund materialize and come to life. So yeah, I'll be keeping a close eye. Yeah, please do. It's very good to have accountability. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully we can come back on in five years time and have a conversation about your fund. Yeah, that would be amazing. Quote of the week. As people, we often have quotes, mantras, proverbs, or even affirmations that keep us going when times are good or when times are challenging. Do you have one that you can share with us today? 
Yeah, so something that uh, I think really I carry along with me is a quote from Chinua Achebe. Oh, brilliant. Which is that if you do not like someone's story, write your own. Fantastic. So that is something that I live by. And that has made me start the business that I have and do the work that I do on my own terms. Yeah, so that's a quote that I really like. I like that one because you are the master of your own destiny. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. As we're coming to the end of the conversation, I was hoping you can give us some closing remarks or final calls to action for anyone who's interested in the legal side of Africa or investing in Africa, East Africa specifically. Uh, Yeah, so thank you so much, first of all, for having me on this uh, podcast. I was going to make a joke earlier because there were so many things I was talking about when (laughs) there were so many things I was talking about where you're like, oh, my gosh, I so understand what you're saying. So I was like, maybe we should do like a support group, (laughs) uh, live support group with other other people who have had experience of doing business and investments in uh, in. Africa and just share our stories and uh, and war stories but that's a joke aside um <laughs> <laughs> to be honest it's actually a good idea <laughs> definitely I think it would be really like quite healing for all of us I mean I sound this is terrible because it sounds like oh my god is it that hard um but it's not it's not really I mean it, it's basically like there's just so much reward in it and I don't know if you agree with me yes. but some of the things that we go through uh, I would say when I talk to my peers in Switzerland uh, doing their deals in, you know, Switzerland and in Europe, they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so but I think there's so much opportunity on the continent right now. And I would really call people to come down here check it out, especially the East African region, to check out the opportunities. But more importantly, if you do decide to invest, please get a good advisor. Because to be honest, you know, I know the the cynical thing is a lot of people say, oh, but, you know, lawyers love conflicts and they love it when things fall apart and they love it when you go to them when everything is a disaster. No, most of us don't. Um, we, we want the happy stories as well, you know. <laughs> yes, 100%. So, so, yeah, so I would encourage people, if they do want to invest, just make sure that the legal side of things is like really intact to get really good advisors. Uh, but yeah, but definitely come down and see what's going on in the region because it's really exciting. What a perfect way to end today's conversation. That has been an extremely open, candid and thought-provoking conversation. Thank you for joining me today on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've shared some great tips, advice and also real-life case studies and scenarios. So it's been brilliant. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today, Amna. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And please keep doing what you're doing because you're really showcasing Africa and all its potential and all its talent. So please keep the podcast and the conversations going on as well. Thank you. I mean, the aim is to have conversations such as today to share the true scenario or situations, the good, the bad, the challenging, the opportunities. Yeah. So today's been a perfect demonstration of that. So thank you for joining me today on the podcast thank you and we will speak soon yeah speak to you soon okay take care you too bye thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast if you've enjoyed this episode please subscribe share or tell a friend about it you can also rate review us in apple podcast or wherever you download your podcast thank you and see you next week for the unlocking africa podcast podcast